a guy that had, you know, 1.4 houses and a bunch of money and all this stuff, uh, 25 bucks now in my life meant $15 for gas and I could eat for three days on $10. Wow. And that's a guy who, I mean, I used to eat Soho or Beverly Hills or, you know, you name it. Um, and I was living in a vacant house mm. in Wichita, Kansas with hardwood floors. And uh, I remember I just, one night I looked around and I was, you know, I was this sober guy that was homeless in a vacant house in Wichita. But I looked around and <laughs> I was just happy. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the peace and serenity that I had tried to drink or drug my way to for decades. Um, it, it was just, I mean, I had it um, and I haven't lost it. I work hard at it. Welcome to The Right to Inspire. Journalist and host Sarah Strackhouse has worked at Fox News, The CW, CBS, NBC, and Time Warner cable stations across the country for more than 10 years and is now focused on telling inspiring stories of those dedicated to making change. She's driving the message home that ultimately you have the right, the freedom, and the power to be the change you want to see in the world. You have the right to inspire. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us. We're shooting at the Real News Communications Network studios. I'm so excited to introduce you to Mike McCoy. He has a fantastic story, was really at the top, fell down and worked his way back up and is now dedicating his life to helping others. I can't wait to introduce you, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. So right now, uh, you are the Chef to Shelters co-founder, CEO. I mean, you have this incredible story of now how you're dedicating your life to helping others. Um, you started on top, you were the VP, multiple companies. I mean, you were big high powered jobs. And then I know that you said that you struggled with addiction and alcoholism, lost everything, actually became homeless at one point, and then has now built built back up. Can you tell me a little bit about your story? And I know the other thing that he's also going to weigh in on is some of the unrest going on in our country right now, some of the struggles that we're seeing when it comes to opioid addiction, etc. But right now we're going to tell your story because I want to talk a little bit about your backstory because it's so inspiring. Um, Sarah, it's been a beautiful, it's his journey, not mine. Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, I'm just here doing his stuff now. Uh, I didn't always realize that. Um, I've worked for some really, really great companies. I've been with Disney, that was Ducks and the Angels. I've been with Hilton Hotels Corporation out of Beverly Hills, lived in Beverly Hills. Um, then uh, Mr. Crow and Mr. Hicks here in Dallas uh, opened Lone Star Park, opened the American Airlines Center, Stars, Rangers, Rodeo, Vice President of Sales. And um, all the while, as I, you know, as I, had a life that most people would say was, you know, a dream life. Um, I was really shallow and hollow inside. And so the progressivism uh, or progressiveness of my disease, alcoholism was growing and growing. And I had back surgery in 2010 um, and I was introduced to opiates uh, in the hospital, morphine in the hospital, and then I got a pain doctor. Um, and you can't tell a guy like me I'm going to get a pain doctor because I'm going to do what I'm going to do and I'm going to work the doctor. So. Uh, by 2012, I'd burnt down my marriage, um, got divorced 2013, 14, and 15. Um, I stayed on a couch under a blanket, um, and I got up to 300 Percocet a month, uh, Adderall to get up, Ambien to go to bed, bottle of scotch a day, wow. and uh, didn't open the blinds for three years. Um, and really just, I, I didn't think there was any chance, you know, a guy like me um, could ever, you know, make a comeback. and. Uh, and uh, he's done some pretty special stuff with me. Um, and uh, Feb 16 of 2016, I woke up and um, called all three doctors that I'd been getting my prescriptions from um, and told them what I'd been doing. And um, uh, they said, you need to go to a rehab or a hospital for the amount of drugs you're on and alcohol. And uh, I said no. And, and I went cold turkey. And it was three weeks. It was really, really rough. Yeah. Um, I sweated through three outfits a night. Wow. Um, got through that, um, still drinking, uh, the alcoholism, you know, it, it, it was there and still taking a hold and, um, fast forward to the week before, uh, Easter on, uh, in 2018, Easter Sunday was going to be on April 1st. I made a decision. It was kind of my hail Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was back in a very dark place. Um, and I said I was going to get baptized and, uh, 
on Easter Sunday, so I did. Um, and uh, the next Sunday, April 8th, when I opened my eyes, it was just gone. Mm -hmm. um, the obsession and the compulsion for alcohol had been removed. And I wow. knew it when I opened my eyes um, and I went downstairs, I threw everything away. And, uh, you know, then, then my journey really, really started. God was just getting busy with me. Um, I was, uh, I have some mentors in my life and they were teaching me, which most, most people know how to live a thorough and, you know, a thoroughly honest life. Um, I hadn't for decades. Sure. And uh, so through that, um, I, uh, on Father's Day of 8, 2018, which was uh, June 17th, I, uh, I lost my place and I became wow. homeless, but I was sober. Um, that's the really neat part of this whole thing. And for 10 months, I popped around. I went to Arkansas and rehabbed a couple of houses for a friend of mine, mm -hmm. um, got those fixed up, sold, and then uh, popped back into Wichita where I'd been before. Um, took garbage to a dump for 25 bucks one day for a friend of mine. And, you know, when... A guy that had, you know, 1.4 houses and a bunch of money and all this stuff, uh, 25 bucks now in my life meant $15 for gas and I could eat for three days on $10. Wow. And that's a guy who, I mean, I used to eat Soho or Beverly Hills or, you know, you name it. Um, and I was living in a vacant house mm -hmm. in Wichita, Kansas with hardwood floors. And uh, I remember I just, one night I looked around and I was, you know, I was this sober guy that was homeless in a vacant house in Wichita. But I looked around and <laughs> I was just happy. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the peace and serenity that I had tried to drink or drug my way to for decades. Um, it, it was just, I mean, I had it um, and I haven't lost it. I work hard at it. Um, wow. But uh, then fast forward to March of 19, uh, God had put on my heart that I was I was in Arizona and uh, mm -hmm. God had put on my heart that I was supposed to come back to Dallas and I talked to one of my mentors and and he said yeah um, and I detailed six cars I, for 50 bucks a car I got back here um, a friend of mine let me stay in his mom's house uh, in a bedroom you know I could have a bedroom there and then God really started getting busy with me um, it got to a point a title company here in town um, that the group offered me a position uh, wow. after my third interview and and I it was on Thursday I think it was April 4th of 2019 and I asked you know when he'd like me to start and uh, and he said on Monday and uh, Monday was April 8th it was my one-year sobriety birthday that's not a coincidence yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, I get choked up I'm sorry yeah no 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 don't apologize I mean it's an incredible amazing journey and God is doing an amazing work in your life and you're doing amazing work to lift yourself up as well I mean it, once you received that information I mean what was that like it was I don't know you know what I'm just some guys coached me up along the way and they said if you just start trying to do the next right thing you're gonna put a lot of those together and the more next right things that I was doing, the less not right things I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, this is the funny part, this is about, it was about midway through 2019. And, and so I can cook, right? <laughs> and uh, I've cooked for like 30 years. Not, I'm self-taught, yeah. you know, uh, not trying, no formal training. And uh, so I called Tim Grigsby at the 24 hour club. Now Tim didn't know me and I didn't know Tim. Mm -hmm. This is Tim, nuclear Holocaust, the world ending, you know, traffic jam, car wreck. I mean, that's Tim, right? Right, 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 even killed. Right, and uh, Tim on the phone, he's, I said, uh, Tim, yeah, this is Mike McCoy. You don't know me, so I'm gonna give me a number. And, and I said, I'd like to come down and cook for the residents at the 24 hour club on Thanksgiving, mm. and it was 2019. And Tim says, oh, you know, Mike, that is so nice. Yeah. Um, the, the Dallas really comes out on Thanksgiving, but thanks for thinking of us. And I said, well, what about Wednesday? And there's this pause and Tim says, um, well, Wednesday. <laughs> I called him Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Who's gonna cook for the people? He goes, um, sure. And yeah. <laughs> that's, that's where this really 
Start. Now, I've never cooked for more than 20 people at this point. Uh -huh. And I said, how many? He said 200. And I wow. said, okay, and hung up the phone. I'm like, I've never cooked for 200 people, but pulled it off. Um, and from there, um, just started making inroads with the sober transition shelters, the sober community, um, and found there's a need for this. Um, and so now today we're up to 29 sober transition shelters or sober living wow. homes. Uh, one treatment center, the, it's uh, Phoenix House, Texas. And I cook for them out of my house in Allen, Texas. 500 people out of my house once a month. How do you do that? How, how, how do you make sure that that happens? And what drives you to keep going? Um, I guess the way it, I don't know the way it happens. It just works in my head. I've always had, the more I have on my plate, the higher functioning I am. Mm. Like if you said, can you move that to there? It might not ever happen. But if you said, can you move everything in this table into the other room and replicate it exactly? I could do it. Huh. That's um, interesting. And then it's a nice I, skill to have. <laughs> <laughs> it, it works most of it the time. It works for you, yeah. Um, and then I started putting it up on my Facebook because um, I didn't, you know, I couldn't fund the whole thing. And yeah. I have the most beautiful friends um, that just support and love me. And it kept growing and growing and growing. And uh, so I lived out in Beverly Hills. Rodney Dangerfield was my next door neighbor when I lived in the Beverly Hilton. Wow. And this is funny. So I'm driving around one day and I started laughing in my car and I said, chef to the stars, I'm chef to the shelters. <laughs> and I, no, I'm not kidding you. That's, right, that's how mean, it came up. And then it popped into my mm -hmm. head for about three more weeks. I kept laughing. I didn't tell one person about it. And then all of a sudden I said, well, let me go to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And I looked it yeah. up and I got all those. Still didn't yeah. tell anybody. I um, finally told somebody and, uh, you know, now, now kind of here we are. Yeah, and it just stuck. Yes. Well, I love it. It's so clever. We were talking about uh, uh, dad jokes before this uh, earlier, and that, that is the epitome of like the perfect timed dad joke, but that's turned into something amazing. So that's incredible. Um, I really, really love that. And you're trying to do something spectacular for Thanksgiving this year. Tell me a little bit about your plan. I will. Um, so Labor Day that just took place, um, we fed 505 people mm -hmm. out of my home. Now, I'm staging everything at my home, and then whether it's Freeman House, Simply Grace, Maggie's House, Dallas 24-Hour Club, Phoenix House, Texas, these are all my clients. Mm -hmm. And they know now, they come up, so I have these, it's this beautiful den with hardwood floors, so I move all the furniture out, put up six-foot tables, tag them, and they all know, they'll look for their tag, blue tape down, and, and they take everything out. Um, so I'm we got done and pulled off literally fed 505 men and women in wow. early sobriety yeah and that's important and i'm going to jump back for one quick second so early sobriety for me um and this is the way my disease works in my head mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm i'm not this is how i thought then so i'm not going to ever have a friend again i can't ever fly again because i drank on planes i can't ever play golf again because i drank on the golf course I can't ever go to a restaurant that has alcohol in it blah 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 on and on and on mm -hmm. these are lies that my disease tells me in my head um and so what i accidentally identified while i was cooking was all the holidays holidays are really tough uh, they were tough for me in early sobriety because you think Memorial Day, Labor Day, Fourth of July, St. Patty's Day. Well, there's beverages mm -hmm. for most people. Most normal people can control right. their consumption, um, and I couldn't. So those were days that were hard for me because you know what? What do I do? Um, today it's very, very easy for me. You know, sure. and, I, and I'll tell you my analogy. Okay, because a lot of my friends, I have, I grew up right across, as I told you, right across the tollway here. But um, uh, you know. I don't like eggplant. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat eggplant, mm -hmm. okay? But I can serve you eggplant. Right. Alcohol is the same way for me. I don't like it. I'm not going to drink it, but you can have it. Right. And that's fine. And so if I have business going somewhere, I'm going to go, like, I take customers to, in my business development role for two different companies right now, I take customers to happy hours quite often. Right. And for me, it's like, I'm just going to drink Toba Chico, but I'm not going to go somewhere that I don't have business going, right? You know? um, and it's very common. It's very normal for me. Um, but anyway, and I forgot what the other half of the question was. Oh, just I mean, what you were planning to do for Thanksgiving? Oh, Thanksgiving, right, right. Up. So, yeah. Thanksgiving. As soon as we got done with the 505, um, the way my brain works, uh, I said, "Well, let's do a thousand. 
And you're like, um, let's double it. I, why not? <laughs> I mean, if I can do 500 out of my house, why couldn't we do a thousand? And we'll, I'm certain we'll get to talk about uh, some of the chefs that are inbound um, to help build this thing out. But, yeah. um, so I reached out. I have friends in the sober community, in the shelter community, um, and I reached out to Our Calling and also Austin Street uh, Center. And I asked them because I knew they had 250, no need to feed 250 each because I've done some work down at both of those places. So I added both of those. So we're going to feed Austin Street Center on Tuesday, our calling on Tuesday, and then we're going to do all of my traditional clients on Wednesday of that week. And it goes back to that'll be my two year anniversary of feeding. Wow. on the Wednesday so it's a really special date for me yeah for sure I love that and then you did say that you had some big names coming in can you talk a little bit about that <laughs> you know it's uh it's been such a great journey um this year I I was very blessed and I'm humbled uh I got asked to go to the Masters and uh, work with a team um under Chef Bustillo Chef Roberto um in Berkman's place and I met these other incredible chefs while I was there um, and I was talking about well I just came up with this idea for this was literally at the inception of my joke my dad joke right chef to the shelter <laughs> and the next thing I know um, for the chefs after the masters were over um, we were talking and they came in May 27th the 28th of this year, we did the first night, we called it Battle of the Chefs, um, 40 people at my home, um, and any food can come out at any time, and Chef Cook from New Orleans, he's a pastry chef, he, uh, sure enough, uh, Chantilly Cake came out first, uh, Chef Tammy, Chef Zagri, Chef Christian, um, they were all there, and food just was flying, it was fun, it was the way my brain works, it's the way their brain works, and there's a, there's a chef, Eric Rapier, and uh, he talks a deal uh, he talks one of his quotes that he did is something happens in a kitchen now to you it would probably look like complete and total chaos um, but Eric Rapier he referred to it as the kitchen dance yeah and it's how everything flows inside of a kitchen with us and we're in unison it really worked at my house so these chefs after they came in for that and they flew back, we started talking a little bit more. And then some other things, I formed a board of directors for mm -hmm. Chef to the Shelter. We've got our nonprofit status now, and we're actively searching for a building. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to build five kitchens inside of a building. Wow. Um, and three of the chefs have committed to moving to Dallas. Wow. To That's incredible. Out. How does it feel to know that? you know where you were where you were feeling so down when you were maybe before you technically started your up you know your your journey before you felt you know the demons cast out if you want to say um you're helping people who are in that point you know you're helping people who feel at their low that are in that same transition how does it feel to know that you're part of their upwards journey i think really a beautiful part of this is that i've been there Mm -hmm. you know and I walk in those shoes every day mm -hmm. um, so I can relate I'm a relatable person mm -hmm. um, and I can share my experience strength and hope with people um, and I'll tell you a story um, they were doing a blog at the 24-hour club um, on chef to the shelters and a person was rec recounting her experience with a female client that they had and the female client had depression so bad and i did not know about this mm -hmm. okay so until i read the blog and april said in the blog that they had a female client that had depression so bad she would never come out of her room except for when chef mike brought his food wow that's so um, special and so the residents of all of these they get a couple hours to you know i remember like all that stuff I told you, I didn't feel like I'd ever have a friend again. I couldn't breathe. It was tough. They get an hour or two hours and they have fellowship and I sit there and we have fun and they, they start to get that memory back of, you know, what it was like to, you know, just be normal in society. Mm -hmm. If there is a really a normal, mm -hmm. um, and, um, the, now when I, when I go to any of them, it's so awesome because I walk in and they're like, what are you cooking today? Right, you know? right, right. Um, and I get to uh, spend a lot of time down there. Um, but the looks on their face, the nonverbal communication, I studied communications in college at the University of Arkansas. Um, the nonverbal communications 
when they just to watch when they eat my food yeah and the flavor profiles hit their palate and all of a sudden they're like you know because I, here's a, okay and i'll go back so here's a guy that's eating all all around the world right and in my 10 months of homelessness there were nights that i was eating a sleeve of crackers for dinner i mean that was it but i was happy don't get me wrong right, there was right. never a sad point in my 10 months of homelessness because i was sober right um and but going back to my corporate life i had i had taken for granted everything in my life i had taken for granted my car my you know the ability to pay bills the the foods that i got to eat right and now um i get to feed lights out meals we're not feeding peanut butter and jelly sandwiches from chef to the shelters on yeah. valentine's day for 212 women at the shelters and several homes uh we made manicotti homemade manicotti out of my house and a homemade caesar salad i make everything fresh everything out of my house wow. i now have three refrigerators at my house yeah, oh yeah. my gosh i'm a homeless amazing. guy and right, i have three right. refrigerators you right. know um but uh it's the looks on their faces sarah yeah. um it just if you ever want to just feel good in your soul and in your heart mm -hmm. um you know go down and do something like this yeah that's amazing. I love that story. And I know that addiction and alcoholism, the disease is so prevalent in our country, especially with the opioid crisis. I mean, what are your thoughts on that as a country? You know, what are some issues that we need to be tackling? And do you have any ideas of how we can start locally in our communities? You know, it's gonna, it's gonna take everybody getting together. It's a really hard, it's a tough topic. I can mm -hmm. tell you that, you know, I mean, I live it daily. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't struggle with the disease anymore because I know that as you know with my spiritual fitness on a daily basis that I'll keep that at bay mm -hmm. and in service to others um, that does that but you know on the opioid side of things you know alcoholism and addiction through COVID uh, just exploded even more it's already a thing um, and check on people check on your friends even you know i and i'll i one of the classic cases of well i i wasn't an addict mm -hmm. all the pills i was getting were from my doctors right okay that's my disease talking to me because it, there is nothing normal about 300 percocet a month adderall to get up amy to go to bed and a bottle of scotch a day well forget the bottle of scotch i'm taking pills and they were prescribed but that's the disease that spoke to me in my head um, and told you it was normal. Right. Um, and so when we go back to the opiate side of things um, or alcoholism, um, you know, I have strong feelings. But one of the things that, you know, and, and I could talk for a long time on that, but you can you can substitute any political situation, any local situation, any national situation, you know, to fill in the blank. And what I've been taught to do is I'm aware of all the issues mm -hmm. okay but i'm the only person that can allow myself to get mad i'm the only person that can allow myself to get sad um it's okay to be aware of everything um but control your emotions which i've learned to do i wish that more people practiced that <laughs> because there is just so much to essentially get angry at right now right. in the country especially with just the division on both sides the extremes on both sides it's so easy to get upset at this side feeling this way this side feeling this way and i wish that more people were able to kind of practice that and kind of take a second take a beat and realize um that you might not be as far from someone else as you think right. people th genuinely think i think they're doing the right thing right. but if they practiced what you're talking about i think the country politicians could get a lot more done but obviously you know not everyone right. feels or thinks that way but you bring up a very good point about once when the country was shut down which i mean say what you will but i i think that hurt more people than it helped there were so many people i mean suicide went went up homelessness went up alcohol and drug addiction went up i mean abuse, uh, abuse went, up. went up domestic right. violence child abuse i mean all of these things went up and to me it just again i don't think it benefited more people than it cost and right as a family member to see someone suffering what would you tell someone who's now maybe you know maybe the country's back open wherever the city's back open what would you tell family members who are saying okay i think my family member has a problem i think alcohol addiction whatever it is got them what would you tell them to do well reach out reach out to somebody um you know there's a, there's so many people 
with so many resources, and, and I'll talk about that just for a minute. So, um, you know, places like the 24-Hour Club, mm -hmm. um, Phoenix House, Texas, Maggie's House, these are places that anybody can reach out, and there's resources, um, and they can talk to people, and they can get you, you know, where you need to be. You know, there's treatment centers in the country. Now, I went to treatment in 2010. I went to the Meadows in mm -hmm. Wickenburg. Um, it didn't take. Mm -hmm. I just, at that point, I wanted the heat off. I didn't want to get divorced. I didn't want to lose my job. So I went for 30 days. I wasn't serious about it. Yeah. Um, and then I came out and, you know, over the course of eight years, you know, scorched the planet. But um, treatment centers serve a role. It's wherever you're, wherever someone's going to be able to hear the message. You know, right. when you've hit your rock bottom. But now with treatment centers, you know, 40000 60000 80000 $120,000. The wow. people that I serve, like these are these people here in our community, they're at places, facilities that take in anybody. It doesn't matter if you have your insurance. It doesn't, you know, your family doesn't have to have, you know, $20,000 cash, $40,000 cash. Right. Um, so reach out to these places. And that's why I really, really have a passion um, for serving um, this community, these are people, all the shelters that were served, the sober transition shelters and sober living homes, these are all people that have said, I need help. Mm -hmm. I've, I've hit rock bottom. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter success ratio, you know, that I'm not factoring that in, but these are people that have taken that first step to getting on their journey, their sobriety journey. Um, and let's help them. Let's make yeah. them feel like they're still part of our society. Yeah. I love that. I, I love that story. Um, well, before we go, I have one last question for you, and it's kind of it's kind of a weird one, but okay. just take a second. Um, if I knew you better, what would I ask you? Wow. Um, <laughs> most people most people ask me like, "Where'd you learn to cook?" <laughs> oh, uh, um, well, you already answered that I one. Know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably about where my passion comes from. Where does it um, come from? You know, it it's definitely you know a God driven thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was for decades of my life, I tried so hard to be somebody I thought you wanted me to be, mm -hmm. and today, I know that my friends love me just the way I am, mm -hmm. and I had to learn that through my sober journey. Um, I don't have to pretend. I can tell you dad jokes. Um, <laughs> I, I can you know, and I. I and have, people love you all more for them. <laughs> right. And, and I, I seriously, I have more fun. I'm more comfortable uh, going down cooking at a shelter than I am sitting in a boardroom where I've been many, many times, you know, in my career past. Um, and it's just the love I have in my heart. Mm. I just love everybody and everything. Um, and I don't say that lightly. Um, mm. You know, one of the things that I've been taught and, you know, spiritually is you know love your enemy mm -hmm. i mean it says it in the bible you mm -hmm. know love your brother um um i'm just filled with love well that's an amazing amazing place to be especially after everything you've been through so thank mike thank you so much for joining us where can people find out more about you uh website's coming online it's uh chef to the shelters org um if people for thanksgiving um our budget and i'll talk real quick on the budget yeah. uh, out of my home, I'm cooking these lights out meals for on a ba cost basis of six dollars and six cents a person, mm -hmm. and that's a full meal, hot meal, killer food. Um, so to feed a thousand and five people, we're going to be roughly six thousand sixty dollars. Um, I usually put it on my Facebook, um, but we've got Zelle, we've got PayPal, we've got Venmo. All of them are at Chef to the Shelters. Um, and then if somebody wants to reach me, I'm certain you'll have my information up on the on the show. And um, thank you so much for what you do. And thanks yeah. for having us on the show. It's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on. It's a message that people need to hear, you know, even if they're local, if they're not local, just that, you know, there is redemption. Yes. Um, there is forgiveness. There is another, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you so much for coming on. And something I have been waiting for this whole time. <laughs> What do we have in front of us? <laughs> uh, you know, it, so in, in 1996, when we were opening Lone Star Park, um, I was charged with, we were pitching to Dr. Pepper for naming, uh, pouring rights. Okay. And so I had to come up come up with some, a recipe with Dr. Pepper in it. Now, in 96, if you young people, we didn't <laughs> have the internet. Um, and I came up with Dr. Pepper Creme Brulee. Okay. And I'm still making it. It came out in a cookbook for the 24-hour club last year. And this year, I'm doing bacon olies.
Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you. Un really, really good. <laughs> I probably well, need another taste just in case. Well, but. and remember, okay, breakfast, so it's got eggs, it's got mm -hmm. heavy cream, you know, sugar. It's so perfect. you're having coffee and eggs mm -hmm. right there. I don't need anything else. Every single day, I could eat that. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now as I'm eating. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, sir. You embody what we're trying to do here. You have the right, the freedom, and the power to be the change you want to see in the world. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Don't forget to follow us on at the right to inspire. We're shooting out here in the Real News Communications Network studios in Dallas, and we'll see you next week. You have the right to inspire.